Welcome back to the Buddhist Bookshelf. In episode 3, we're excited to introduce the Sarlas Flowers by Tien Phuc, a treasury of over 560 Buddha Dharma lessons, offering profound insights for your journey to the Buddha's realm. Your support, through likes, shares, and subscriptions, is invaluable. Join us as we embark on this enlightening journey through this precious book together. 43.Karma From morning to night, we create karma with our body, with our mouth, and with our mind. In our thoughts, we always think that people are bad. In our mouth, we always talk about other people's rights and wrongs, tell lies, say indecent things, scold people, backbite, and so on. Karma is one of the fundamental doctrines of Buddhism. Everything that we encounter in this life, good or bad, sweet or bitter, is a result of what we did in the past or from what we have done recently in this life. Good karma produces happiness, bad karma produces pain and suffering. So, what is karma? Karma is a Sanskrit word, literally means a deed or an action and a reaction, the continuing process of cause and effect. Moral or any good or bad action, however, the word karma is usually used in the sense of evil bent or mind, resulting from past wrongful actions, taken while living which causes corresponding future retribution, either good or evil transmigration, action and reaction, the continuing process of cause and effect. Karma is neither fatalism nor a doctrine of predetermination. Our present life is formed and created through our actions and thoughts in our previous lives. Our present life and circumstances are the product of our past thoughts and actions, and in the same way our deeds in this life will fashion our future mode of existence. According to the definition of the karma, the past influences the present but does not dominate it, for karma is past as well as present. However, both past and present influence the future. The past is a background against which life goes on from moment to moment. The future is yet to be. Only the present moment exists in the responsibility of using the present moment for good or bad. Lies with each individual. A karma can be created by body, speech, or mind. There are good karma, evil karma, and indifferent karma. All kinds of karma are accumulated by the alayavijnana and manas. Karma can be cultivated through religious practice, good, and uncultivated. For sentient being has lived through innumerable reincarnations, each has boundless karma. Whatever kind of karma is, a result would be followed accordingly, sooner or later. No one can escape the result of his own karma. Karma is a Sanskrit term which means action, good or bad including attachments, aversions, defilements, anger, jealousy, etc. Karma is created, formed, by that being's conceptions, samskara. This potential directs one behavior and steers the motives for all present and future deeds. In Buddhism, karma arises from three factors. Body, speech and mind. For instance, when you are speaking, you create a verbal act. When you do something, you create a physical act. And when you are thinking, you may create some mental actions. Mental actions are actions that have no physical or verbal manifestations. Buddhist ethical theory is primarily with volitional actions, that is, those actions that result from deliberate choice for such actions set in motion a series of events that inevitably produce concordant results. These results may be either pleasant or unpleasant, depending on the original votion. In some cases the results of actions are experienced immediately, and in others they are only manifested at a later time. Some karmic results do not accrue, don't lie, until a future life. Karmas are actions that lead to both immediate and long-range results. All good and evil actions taken while living. Action and appropriate result of action. Karma is not limited by time or space. And our deeds, however trifling, leave traces physically, mentally, and environmentally. The traces left in our minds include memory, knowledge, habit, intelligence, and character. They are produced by the accumulation of our experiences and deeds over a long period of time. The traces that our deeds leave on our body can be seen easily, but only part of traces in our minds remain on the surface of our mind, the rest of them are hidden depths of our minds, or sunk in the subconscious mind. This is the complexity and seriousness of the karma. 
According to Buddhism, a karma is not a fate or a destiny, neither is it a simple, unconscious, and involuntary action. On the contrary, it is an intentional, conscious, deliberate, and willful action. Also according to Buddhism, any actions will lead to similar results without any exception. It is to say, as one sows, so shall one reap. According to one's action, so shall be the fruit. If we do a wholesome action, we will get a wholesome fruit. If we do an unwholesome action, we will get an unwholesome result. Devout Buddhists should try to understand the law of karma. Once we understand that in our own life every action will have a similar and equal reaction, and once we understand that we will experience the effect of that action, we will refrain from committing unwholesome deeds. Karma is a product of body, speech and mind, while recompense is a product or result of karma. Karma is like a seed sown, and recompense is like a tree grown with fruits. When the body does good things, the mouth speaks good words, the mind thinks of good ideas, then the karma is a good seed. In the contrary, the karma is an evil seed. According to the Buddhist doctrines, every action produces an effect, and it is a cause first and effect afterwards. We therefore speak of karma as the law of cause and effect. There is no end to the result of an action if there is no end to the karma. Life in nowadays society, it is extremely difficult for us not to create any karma, however, we should be very careful about our actions, so that their effect will be only good. Thus the Buddha taught. To lead a good life, you Buddhists should make every effort to control the activities of your body, speech, and mind. Do not let these activities hurt you and others. Recompense corresponds karma without any exception. Naturally, good seed will produce a healthy tree and delicious fruits, while bad seed gives worse tree and fruits. Therefore, unless we clearly understand and diligently cultivate the laws of cause and effect, or karma and result, we cannot control our lives and experience a life the way we wish to. According to the Buddha Dharma, no gods, nor heavenly deities, nor demons can assert their powers on us, we are totally free to build our lives the way we wish. According to Buddhist doctrines, karma is always just. It neither loves nor hates, neither rewards nor punishes. Karma and recompense is simply the law of cause and effect. If we accumulate good karma, the result will surely be happy and joyous. No demons can harm us. In the contrary, if we create evil karma, no matter how much and earnestly we pray for help, the result will surely be bitter and painful, no gods can save us. According to Buddhism, man is the creator of his own life and his own destiny. All the good and bad that comes our way in life is the result of our own actions reacting upon us. Our joys and sorrows are the effects of which our actions, both in the distant and the immediate past, are the causes. And what we do in the present will determine what we become in the future. Since man is the creator of his own life, to enjoy a happy and peaceful life he must be a good creator, that is, he must create good karma. Good karma comes ultimately from a good mind, from a pure and calm mind. The law of karma binds together the past, present, and future lives of an individual through the course of his transmigration. To understand how such a connection is possible between the experiences and actions of an individual in successive lives, we must take a brief look at the Buddhist analysis of consciousness. According to the Buddhist philosophy of consciousness, the Vijnanavada school, there are eight kinds of consciousness. The first five are the eye, ear, nose, tongue and body consciousnesses. These make possible the awareness of the five kinds of external sense data through the five sense organs. The sixth consciousness is the intellectual consciousness, the faculty of judgment which discerns, compares, and distinguishes the sense data and ideas. The seventh consciousness, called the manas, is the ego consciousness, the inward awareness of oneself as an ego, and the clinging to discrimination between oneself and others. Even when the first six kinds of consciousness are not functioning, for example, in deep sleep, the seventh consciousness is still present, and if threatened, this consciousness, through the impulse of self-protection, will cause us to awaken. The eighth consciousness is called Alaya Vijnana, the storehouse consciousness. Because this consciousness is so deep, it is very difficult to understand. 
The Alaya Vijnana is a repository which stores all the impressions of our deeds and experiences. Everything we see, hear, smell, taste, touch, and do deposits, so to speak, a seed is a nucleus of karmic energy. Since the Alaya hoards all the seeds of our past actions, it is the architect of our destiny. Our life and character reflect the seeds in our store consciousness. If we deposit bad seeds, i.e., perform more evil actions, we will become bad persons. Since Buddhism places ultimate responsibility for our life in our own hands, if we want our hands to mold our life in a better way, we must launch our minds in a better direction, for it is the mind which controls the hands which mold our life. However, sometimes we know someone who is virtuous, gentle, kind, loving and wise, and yet his life is filled with troubles from morning to night. Why is this? What happens to our theory that good acts lead to happiness and bad acts to suffering? To understand this, we must realize that the fruits of karma do not necessarily mature in the same lifetime in which the karma is originally accumulated. Karma may bring about its consequences in the next life or in succeeding lives. If a person was good in a previous life, he may enjoy happiness and prosperity in this life, even though his conduct now is bad. And a person who is very virtuous now may still meet a lot of trouble because of bad karma from a past life. It is like planting different kinds of seeds, some will come to flower very fast, others will take a long time, maybe years. The law of cause and effect does not come about at different times, in different forms and at different locations. While some of our experiences are due to karma in the present life, others may be due to karma from previous lives. In the present life, we receive the results of our actions done in past lives as well as in the present. And what we reap in the future will be the result of what we do in the present. The doctrine of karma is not merely a doctrine of cause and effect, but of action and reaction. The doctrine holds that every action willfully performed by an agent, be it of thought, word, or deed, tends to react upon that agent. The law of karma is a natural law, and its operation cannot be suspended by any power of a deity. Our action brings about their natural results. Recognizing this, Buddhists do not pray to a god for mercy, but rather regulate their actions to bring them into harmony with the universal law. If they do evil, they try to discover their mistakes and rectify their ways, and if they do good, they try to maintain and develop that good. Buddhists should not worry about the past, but rather be concerned about what we are doing in the present. Instead of running around seeking salvation, we should try to sow good seeds in the present and leave the results to the law of karma. The theory of karma in Buddhism makes man and no one else the architect of his own destiny. From moment to moment we are producing and creating our own destiny through our thought, our speech and our deeds. Thus the ancient said. Sow a thought and reap an act, sow an act and reap a habit, sow a habit and reap a character, sow a character and reap a destiny. The karma that we have now is very deep-rooted and complex, and includes the former karma that human beings have accumulated since their beginning. We also possess the former karma that we have produced ourselves in previous existences, and to some extent the former karma that our ancestors have produced, for those who were born in the same family, from generation to generation, or in the same country, would bear the same kinds of karma to some extent. And of course we possess the present karma that we have produced ourselves in this life. Is it possible for an ordinary person to become free from these karmas and enter the mental state of perfect freedom, escape from the world of illusion, by means of his own wisdom? This is clearly out of the question. What then, if anything, can we do about it? All that one has experienced, thought and felt in the past remains in the depths of one's subconscious mind. Psychologists recognize that the subconscious mind not only exerts a great influence on man's character and his mental functions, but even causes various disorders. Because it is normally beyond our reach, we cannot control the subconscious mind by mere reflection and meditation. When we plant a black pepper seed, black pepper plant grows and we will reap black pepper, not oranges. Similarly, when we act positively, happiness follows, not suffering. When we act destructively, misery comes, not happiness. 
Just as small seed can grow into a huge tree with much fruit, small actions can bring large result. Therefore, we should try to avoid even small negative actions and to create small negative ones. If the cause isn't created, the result does not occur. If no seed is planted, nothing grows. The person who hasn't created the cause to be killed won't be even if he or she is in a car crash. According to the Buddha, man makes his own destiny. He should not blame anyone for his troubles since he alone is responsible for his own life, for either better or worse. Your difficulties and troubles are actually self-caused. They arise from actions rooted in greed, hatred and delusion. In fact, suffering is the price you pay for craving for existence and sensual pleasures. The price which comes as physical pain and mental agony is a heavy one to pay. It is like paying monthly payment for the brand new Chevrolet Corvette you own. The payment is the physical pain and mental agony you undergo, while the Corvette is your physical body through which you experience the worldly pleasures of the senses. You have to pay the price for the enjoyment. Nothing is really free of charge unfortunately. If we act positively, the happy result will eventually occur. When we do negative actions, the imprints aren't lost even though they may not bring their results immediately. Devout Buddhists should always remember that, the ocean's water may dry up, mountain may waste away, the actions done in former lives are never lost, on the contrary, they come to fruit though eons after eons pass, until at last the debt is paid body, speech, and mind all make karma when we cling. We create habits that can make us suffer in the future. This is the fruit of our attachment, of our past defilement. Remember, not only body but also speech and mental action can make conditions for future results. If we did some act of kindness in the past and remember it today, we will be happy, and this happy state of mind is the result of past karma. In other words, all things conditioned by cause, both long-term and moment-to-moment. -moment. According to Buddhist tradition, there are two kinds of karma. Intentional karma and unintentional karma. Intentional karma which bears much heavier karma vipaka, phala. Unintentional karma which bears lighter karma vipaka. There are also two other kinds of karma. The wholesome and the unwholesome. Wholesome, good karma such as giving charity, kind speech, helping others, etc. Unwholesome, bad karma such as killing, stealing, lying and slandering. According to Prof. Jinjiro Takakusu in the Essentials of Buddhist Philosophy, there are two kinds of action and action influence. The first type of karma is the drawing action. Drawing action causes a being to be born as a man, as a diva, or as an animal. No other force can draw a living being into a particular form of life. The second type of karma is the fulfilling action. After the kind of life has been determined, the fulfilling action completes the formal quality of the living being so that it will be a thorough specimen of the kind. There are two kinds of action influence. The first kind of action influence is individual action influence which creates the individual being. Individual action influence or individual karmas are those actions that sentient beings act individually. The second kind of action influence is common action influence creates the universe itself. The common action influence karma involved in this world system is not just that of human beings, but of every type of sentient being in the system. Also according to the Buddhist tradition, there are three kinds of karma. Action, behavior, of the body behavior of the speech, and behavior of the mind. There are three other kinds of karma. Present life happy karma, present life unhappy karma, and karma of an imperturbable nature. There are still three other kinds of karma. Karma of ordinary rebirth, karma of Hinayana Nirvana, and karma of Mahayana Nirvana. There are still three other kinds of karma. Good karmas, bad karmas, and neutral karmas. There are still three other kinds of karma, which also called three stages of karma. The first stage of karma is the past karma. Past karma is the cause for some results, effects, reaped in the present life. The second stage of karma is the present karma with present results. Present karma is the cause for some results, effects, reaped in the present life, present deeds and their consequences in this life. 
The second stage of karma is the present karma with future results. Present karma, deed, is the cause for some or all results reaped in the next or future lives. Present deeds and their next life consequences, present deeds and consequences after next life. According to the Sanjiti Sutta in the Long Discourses of the Buddha, there are four kinds of kama. The first kind of karma is the black kama, or evil deeds with black results. The second kind of karma is the bright kama with bright result. The third kind of karma is the black and bright kama with black and bright result. The fourth kind of karma is the kama that is neither black nor bright, with neither black nor bright result, leading to the destruction of kama. According to Mahayana Buddhism, there are four kinds of karmas. The first kind of karma is the accumulated karma, which results from many former lives. The second kind of karma is the repeated karma, which forms during the present life. The third kind of karma is the most dominant karma, which is able to subjugate other karmas. The fourth kind of karma is the near-death karma which is very strong. According to the Abhidharma, there are four types of kama, karma. Good karmas, bad karmas, neutral karmas, and karmas in the state of cessation. Especially, Karmas in the state of cessation is the state of the activities having ceased, and this remains in the mental continuum. This state of cessation is an affirming negative, an absence which includes something positive. It is a potency which is not just the mere cessation of the action, but has the capacity of producing an effect in the future. These states of cessation are capable of regenerating moment by moment until an effect is produced. No matter how much time passes, when it meets with the proper conditions, it fructifies or matures. If one has not engaged in a means to cause the potency to be reduced, such as confession and intention of restraint in committing these bad actions again, then these karmas will just remain. There are still four other kinds of karma. Productive kama, supportive kama, obstructive kama, and destructive kama. When a disciple came to the Buddha penitent over past misdeeds, the Buddha did not promise any forgiveness, for he knew that each must reap the results of the seeds that he had sown. Instead he explained, If you know that what you have done is wrong and harmful, from now on do not do it again. If you know that what you have done is right and profitable, continue to do it. Destroy bad karma and cultivate good karma. You should realize that what you are in the present is a shadow of what you were in the past, and what you will be in the future is a shadow of what you are now in the present. You should always apply your mind to the present so that you may advance on the way. In the Anguttara Nikaya Sutra, the Buddha taught. O oh, Bhikkhus! Mental volition is what I call action or karma. Having volition one acts by body, speech and thought. In the Dhammapada Sutta, the Buddha taught. Of all dharmas, mind is the forerunner, mind is chief. We are what we think, we have become what. We thought, what we are today came from our thoughts of yesterday. If we speak or act with a deluded mind or evil thoughts, suffering or pain follows us, as the wheel follows the hoof of the draft ox, Dharmapada 1. Of all dharmas, mind is the forerunner, mind is chief. We are what we think, we have become what we thought. If we speak or act with a pure mind or thought, happiness and joy follows us, as our own shadow that never leaves, Dharmapada 2. The deed is not well done of which a man must repent, and the reward of which he receives, weeping, with tearful face, one reaps the fruit thereof, Dhammapada 67. The deed is well done when, after having done it, one repents not, and when, with joy and pleasure, one reaps the fruit thereof, Dhammapada 68. As long as the evil deed done does not bear fruit, the fool thinks it is as sweet as honey, but when it ripens, then he comes to grief, Dhammapada 69. Those are rats whose mind is calm, whose speech and deed are calm. They have also obtained right knowing, they have thus become quiet men, Dhammapada 96. Let's hasten up to do good. Let's restrain our minds from evil thoughts, for the minds of those who are slow in doing good actions delight in evil. Dhammapada 116. If a person commits evil, let him not do it again and again, he should not rejoice therein, sorrow is the outcome of evil, Dhammapada. 117. If a person does a meritorious deed, he should do it habitually, 
he should find pleasures therein, happiness is the outcome of merit, Dhammapada 118. Even an evildoer sees good as long as evil deed is not yet ripened, but when his evil deed is ripened, then he sees the evil results, Dhammapada 119. Even a good person sees evil, as long as his good deed is not yet ripened, but when his good deed is ripened, then he sees the good results, Dhammapada 120. Do not disregard, underestimate, small evil, saying, it will not matter to me. By the falling of drop by drop, a water jar is filled, likewise, the fool becomes full of evil, even if he gathers it little by little, Dhammapada 121. Do not disregard small good, saying, it will not matter to me. Even by the falling of drop by drop, a water jar is filled, likewise, the wise man, gathers his merit little by little, Dhammapada 122. An evil deed is better not done, a misdeed will bring future suffering. A good deed is better done now, for after doing it one does not grieve, Dhammapada 314. All conditioned things are without a real self. One who perceives this with wisdom, ceases grief and achieves liberation. This is the path of purity. Dharmapada 279. According to the Earth Store Bodhisattva Sutra, the Earth Store Bodhisattva advises sentient beings based on their circumstances. If Earth Store Bodhisattva meets those who take life, he speaks of a retribution of a short lifespan. If he meets robbers and petty thieves, he speaks of a retribution of poverty and acute suffering. If he meets those who commit sexual misconduct, he speaks of the retribution of being born as pigeons and as mandarin ducks and drakes. If he meets those of harsh speech, he speaks of the retribution of a quarreling family. If he meets slanderers, he speaks of the retribution of a tongueless and cankerous mouth. If he meets those with anger and hatred, he speaks of being ugly and crippled. If he meets those who are stingy, he speaks of frustrated desires. If he meets gluttons, he speaks of the retribution of hunger, thirst and sicknesses, illnesses, of the throat. If he meets those who enjoy hunting, he speaks of a frightening insanity and disastrous fate. If he meets those who rebel against their parents, he speaks of the retribution of being killed in natural disasters. If he meets those who set fire to mountains or forests, he speaks of the retribution of seeking to commit suicide in the confusion of insanity. If he meets malicious parents or step-parents, he speaks of the retribution of being flogged in future lives. If he meets those who net and trap young animals, he speaks of the retribution of being separated from their own children. If he meets those who slander the triple jewel, he speaks of the retribution of being blind, deaf or mute. If he meets those who slight the Dharma and regard the teachings with arrogance, he speaks of the retribution of dwelling in the evil path. If he meets those who destroy or misuse possessions of the permanently dwelling, he speaks of the retribution of revolving in the hells for millions of kalpas. If he meets those who defile the pure conduct of others and falsely accuse the Sangha, he speaks of the retribution of an eternity in the animal realm. If he meets those who scald, burn, behead, chop up or otherwise harm living beings, he speaks of the retribution of repayment in kind. If he meets those who violate precepts and the regulations of pure eating, he speaks of the retribution of being born as birds and beasts suffering from hunger and thirst. If he meets those who are arrogant and haughty, he speaks of the retribution of being servile and of low classes. If he meets those whose double-tongued behavior causes dissension and discord, he speaks of retribution of tonguelessness, being mute, and speech impediments. If he meets those of deviant view, he speaks of the retribution of rebirth in the frontier regions. 44. Karma of the body. According to Buddhism, man is pankakanda. The physical body is produced from the essence of food, which is a combination of multiple conditions in the world, digested by the father communicated to the mother and established in the womb. Such a person is conditioned by this physical and mental world. He relates closely to others, to society, and to nature, but can never exist by himself. The five aggregates of man are the operation of the twelve elements among which, aggregate of form is understood as a person's physical body, aggregate of feeling includes feelings of suffering, of happiness, and of indifference. 
it is known as feelings arising from eye contact, ear contact, nose contact, tongue contact, body contact and mind contact. Aggregate of perception includes perception of body, of sound, of odor, of taste, of touch, and of mental objects or phenomena. Aggregate of activities is all mental, oral, and bodily activities. It is also understood as vocational acts occasioned by body, by sound, by odor, by taste, by touching or by ideas. Aggregate of consciousness includes eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind consciousnesses. In the turning the Dharma Kakra Sutra, the Buddha taught very clearly about the Pankakanda as follows. Bixis, the form, feeling, perception, activities, and consciousness are impermanent, suffering, and void of the self. Let us examine the body and mind to see whether in either of them we can locate the self, we will find in neither of them. Then, the so-called self is just a term for a collection of physical and mental factors. Let us first look at the aggregate matter of form. The aggregate of form corresponds to what we would call material or physical factors. It includes not only our own bodies, but also the material objects that surround us, i.e., houses, soil, forests, and oceans, and so on. However, physical elements by themselves are not enough to produce experience. The simple contact between the eyes and visible objects, or between the ear and sound, cannot result in experience without consciousness. Only the co-presence of consciousness together with the sense of organ and the object of the sense organ produces experience. In other words, it is when the eyes, the visible object and consciousness come together that the experience of a visible object is produced. Consciousness is therefore an extremely important element in the production of experience. Consciousness or the sixth sense, or the mind. This sense organ together with the other five sense organs of eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body to produce experience. The physical and mental factors of experience work together to produce personal experience, and the nature of the five aggregates are in constant change. Therefore, according to the Buddha's teachings, the truth of a man is selfless. The body and mind that man misunderstands of his self is not a self, it is not his, and he is not it. Devout Buddhists should grasp this idea firmly to establish an appropriate method of cultivation not only for the body, but also for the speech and mind. According to the Vimalakirti Sutra, Vimalakirti used expedient means of appearing illness in his body to expound about sentient beings' bodies and the Buddha's body to save them. Because of his indisposition, kings, ministers, elders, apasakas, brahmins, et as well as princes and other officials numbering many thousands came to inquire after his health. So the Malakurti appeared in his sick body to receive and expound the Dharma to them, saying, Virtuous ones, the human body is impermanent, it is neither strong nor durable, it will decay and is, therefore, unreliable. It causes anxieties and sufferings, being subject to all kinds of ailments, Virtuous ones, all wise men do not rely on this body which is like a mass of foam, which is intangible. It is like a bubble and does not last for a long time. It is like a flame and is the product of the thirst of love. It is like a banana tree, the center of which is hollow. It is like an illusion being produced by inverted thoughts. It is like a dream being formed by facial views. It is like a shadow and is caused by karma. This body is like an echo for it results from causes and conditions. It is like a floating cloud which disperses any moment. It is like lightning for it does not stay for the time of a thought. It is ownerless for it is like the earth. It is egoless for it is like fire that kills itself. It is transient like the wind. It is not human for it is like water. It is unreal and depends on the four elements for its existence. It is empty, being neither ego nor its object. It is without knowledge like grass, trees and potsherds. It is not the prime mover, but is moved by the wind, of passions. It is impure and full of filth. It is false, and though washed, bathed, clothed and fed, it will decay and die in the end. It is a calamity being subject to all kinds of illnesses and sufferings. It is like a dry well for it is pursued by death. It is unsettled and will pass away. 
it is like a poisonous snake, a deadly enemy, a temporary assemblage, without underlying reality, being made of the five aggregates, the twelve entrances, the six organs and their objects, and the eighteen realms of sense, the six organs, their objects and their perceptions. However, when Manjusri Bodhisattva asked Vimalakirti about what should a Bodhisattva say when comforting another Bodhisattva who falls ill, Vimalakirti replied, he should speak of the impermanence of the body, but never of the abhorrence and relinquishment of the body. He should speak of the suffering body, but never of the joy in nirvana. He should speak of egolessness in the body while teaching and guiding all living beings, in spite of the fact that they are fundamentally non-existent in the absolute state. He should speak of the voidness of the body, but should never cling to the ultimate nirvana. He should speak of repentance of past sins, but should avoid slipping into the past. Because of his own illness he should take pity on all those who are sick. Knowing that he has suffered during countless past eons, he should think of the welfare of all living beings. He should think of his past practice of good virtues to uphold his determination for right livelihood. Instead of worrying about troubles, Klesa, he should give rise to zeal and devotion in his practice of the Dharma. He should act like a king physician to cure others' illnesses. Thus a bodhisattva should comfort another sick bodhisattva to make him happy. A sick bodhisattva should look into all things in this way. He should further meditate on his body which is impermanent, is subject to suffering and is non-existent and egoless, this is called wisdom. Although his body is sick he remains in the realm of birth and death, for the benefit of all living beings, without complaint, this is called expedient method, upaya. Manjusri. He should further meditate on the body which is inseparable from illness and on illness, which is inherent in the body because sickness and the body are neither new nor old, this is called wisdom. The body, though ill, is not to be annihilated, this is the expedient method for remaining in the world to work for salvation. Virtuous ones, the human body being so repulsive, you should seek the Buddha body. Why? Because the Buddha body is called Dharmakaya, the product of boundless merits and wisdom, the outcome of discipline, meditation, wisdom, liberation and perfect knowledge of liberation, the result of kindness, compassion, joy and indifference to emotions, the consequence of the six perfections or paramitas, charity, discipline, patience, zeal, meditation and wisdom. And the sequel of expedient teaching, Abhaya, the six supernatural powers, the three insights, the thirty-seven stages contributory to enlightenment, serenity and insight, the ten transcendental powers, Dasabala, the four kinds of fearlessness, the eighteen unsurpassed characteristics of the Buddha, the wiping out of all evils, and the performance of all good deeds, truthfulness, and freedom from looseness and unrestraint. So countless kinds of purity and cleanness produce the body of the Tathagata. Virtuous ones, if you want to realize the Buddha body in order to get rid of all the illnesses of a living being, you should set your minds on the quest of supreme enlightenment, Anatara Samyak Sambodhi. All things have changed and will never cease to change. The human body is changeable, thus governed by the law of impermanence. Our body is different from the minute before to that of the minute after. Biological researches have proved that the cells in our body are in constant change, and in every seven years all the old cells have been totally renewed. These changes help us quickly grow up, age and die. The longer we want to live, the more we fear death. From childhood to aging, human life is exactly like a dream, but there are many people who do not realize, therefore, they continue to launch into the noose of desire. As a result, they suffer from greed and will suffer more if they become attached to their possessions. Sometimes at time of death they still don't want to let go anything. There are some who know that they will die soon, but they still strive desperately to keep what they cherish most. However, of all precious jewels, life is the greatest, if there is life, it is the priceless jewel. Thus, if you are able to maintain your livelihood, someday you will be able to rebuild your life. However, everything in life, if it has form characteristics, then, inevitably, one day it will be destroyed. 
A human life is the same way, if there is life, there must be death. Even though we say a hundred years, it passes by in a flash, like lightning streaking across the sky, like a flower's blossom, like the image of the moon at the bottom of a lake, like a short breath, what is really eternal. Sincere Buddhists should always remember when a person is born, not a single dime is brought along, therefore, when death arrives, not a word will be taken either. A lifetime of work, putting the body through pain and torture in order to accumulate wealth and possessions, in the end everything is worthless and futile in the midst of birth, old age, sickness, and death. After death, all possessions are given to others in a most senseless and pitiful manner. At such time, there are not even a few good merits for the soul to rely and lean on for the next life. Therefore, such an individual will be condemned into the three evil paths immediately. Ancient sages taught. A steel tree of a thousand years once again blossom, such a thing is still not bewildering, but once a human body has been lost, ten thousand reincarnations may not return. Sincere Buddhists should always remember what the Buddha taught. It is difficult to be reborn as a human being, it is difficult to encounter, meet or learn, the Buddha Dharma, now we have been reborn as a human being, and encountered the Buddha Dharma, if we let the time passes by in vain, we waste our scarce lifespan. Thus, the Buddha advised his disciples to cultivate in every minute and every second of the current life. According to the Kegadasati Sutta in the middle-length discourses of the Buddha, cultivation of mindfulness of the body means when walking, a person understands that he is walking, when standing, he understands that he is standing, when sitting, he understands that he is sitting, when lying, he understands that he is lying. He understands accordingly however his body is disposed. As he abides thus diligent, ardent, and resolute, his memories and intentions based on the household life are abandoned. That is how a person develops mindfulness of the body. The body itself is a very good object in cultivation and in meditation. The body regarded as a field which produces good and evil fruit in the future existence. According to Buddhism, in order to produce wholesome fruit, devout Buddhists should put themselves in harmony with nature and the natural laws which govern the universe. This harmony arises through charity, generosity, love, and wisdom, for they are the causes of unselfishness, sympathy and altruism, compassion and equanimity, humanity and goodwill, renunciation and serenity. The first goal of meditation practices is to realize the true nature of the body, and to be non-attached to it. Most people identify themselves with their bodies. However, after a period of time of meditation practices, we will no longer care to think of yourself as a body, we will no longer identify with the body. At that time, we will begin to see the body as it is. It is only a series of physical and mental process, not a unity, and we no longer mistake the superficial for the real. Mindfulness of your body in daily life activities, such as mindfulness of your body while walking, standing, lying, sitting, looking at someone, looking around the environments, bending, stretching, dressing, washing, eating, drinking, chewing, talking, etc. The purpose of mindfulness is to pay attention to your behavior, but not to run after any events. 45. The Karma of the Mouth karma of the mouth is one of the three karmas. The other two are karma of the body and of the mind. The others are karma of the body, thaniyap, and karma of thought, yuniyap. According to the Buddha's teachings, the karmic consequences of speech karma are much greater than the karmic consequences of the mind and the body karma, because when thoughts arise, they are not yet apparent to everyone, however, as soon as words are spoken, they will be heard immediately. Using the body to commit evil can sometimes be impeded. The thing that should be feared is false words that come out of a mouth. As soon as a wicked thought arises, the body has not supported the evil thought, but the speech had already blurted out vicious landers. The body hasn't time to kill, but the mind already made the threats, the mind just wanted to insult, belittle, or ridicule someone. The body has not carried out any drastic actions, but the speech is already rampant in its malicious verbal abuse, etc. 
The mouth is the gate and door to all hatred and revenge, it is the karmic retribution of of the Avicii hell, it is also the great burning oven destroying all of one's virtues and merits. Therefore, ancients always reminded people. Diseases are from the mouth, and calamities are also from the mouth. If wickedness is spoken, then one will suffer unwholesome karmic retributions, if goodness is spoken, then one will reap the wholesome karmic retributions. If you praise others, you shall be praised. If you insult others, you shall be insulted. It's natural that what you sow is what you reap. We should always remember that the theory of karmic retributions is flawless, and then courageously take responsibility by cultivating so karmic transgressions will be eliminated gradually, and never blame heaven nor blaming others. The evil karma of speech is the mightiest. We must know that evil speech is even more dangerous than fire, because fire can only destroy all material possessions and treasures of this world, but the fierce fire of evil speech not only burns all the seven treasures of enlightened beings and all virtues of liberation, but it will also reflect on the evil karma of Apaka in the future. Zen practitioners should always remember the ancients and saintly beings' teachings about the karma of the mouth. Mouth chanting Buddha recitation or any Buddha is like excreting precious jewels and gemstones and will have the consequence of being born in heaven or the Buddha's pure lands. Mouth speaking good and wholesomely is like praying exquisite fragrances and one will attain all that was said to people. Mouth encouraging, teaching, and aiding people is like emitting beautiful lights, destroying the false and ignorant speech and dark minds for others and for self. Mouth speaking truths and honesty is like using valuable velvets to give warmth to those who are cold. Mouth speaking without benefits for self or others is like chewing on sawdust, it is like so much better to be quiet and save energy. In other words, if you don't have anything nice to say, it is best not to say anything at all. Mouth lying to ridicule others is like using paper as a cover for a well, killing travelers who fall into the well because they were not aware or setting traps to hurt and murder others. Mouth joking and poking fun is like using words and daggers to wave in the marketplace, someone is bound to get hurt or die as a result. Mouth speaking wickedness, immorality, and evil is like spitting foul odors and must endure evil consequences equal to what was said. Mouth speaking vulgarly, crudely, and uncleanly is like spitting out worms and maggots and will face the consequences of hell and animal life. Zen practitioners should always remember to develop the mind to be frightened and then try to guard our speech karma. Zen practitioners should always remember that mouth speaking without benefits for self or others is like chewing on sawdust, it is so much better to be quiet and save energy. It is to say if you don't have anything nice to say, it is best not to say anything at all. Mouth lying to ridicule others is like using paper as a cover for a well killing travelers who fall into the well because they were not aware. It is similar to setting traps to hurt and murder others. Mouth joking and poking fun is like using swords and daggers to wave in the marketplace, someone is bound to get hurt or die as the result. Mouth speaking of wickedness, immorality, and evil is like spitting foul odors and must endure evil consequences equal to what was said. Mouth speaking vulgarly, foully, uncleanly is like spitting out worms and maggots and will face the consequences of the three evil paths from hells, hungry ghosts to animals. Zen practitioners should always remember that if we cannot cease our karma of the mouth, we should try to develop the good ones. A saying can lead people to love and respect you for the rest of your life, also a saying can lead people to hate, despite, and become an enemy for an entire life. A saying can lead to a prosperous and successful life, also a saying can lead to the loss of all wealth and possessions. A saying can lead to a greatly enduring nation, also a saying can lead to the loss and devastation of a nation. Mouth speaking good and wholesomely is like spraying exquisite fragrances, and one will attain all that was said to people. Mouth encouraging, teaching, and aiding people is like emitting beautiful lights, destroying the false and ignorant speech and dark minds of the devil and false cultivators. Mouth speaking of truths and honesty is like using valuable velvets to give warmth to those who are cold. The spoken words of saints, sages, and enlightened beings of the past were like gems and jewels, 
leaving behind much love, esteem, and respect from countless people for thousands of years into the future. As for Zen practitioners nowadays, if we cannot speak words like jewels and gems, then it is best to remain quiet, be determined not to toss out words that are wicked and useless. 46. The Karma of the Mind. The function of mind or thought, one of the three kinds of karma, thought, word, and deed. Compared to the karma of the mouth, karma of the mind is difficult to establish, thought is just risen within the mind, but does not take appearance or become action, therefore, transgressions have not formed. Vijnanas does not depend on any of the five sense faculties, but on the immediately preceding continuum of mind. Mental consciousness apprehends not only objects, form, sound, taste, smell, touch, in the present time, but it also apprehends objects in the past, and imagines objects even in the future. Mental consciousness will go with us from one life to another, while the first five consciousnesses are our temporary minds. Consciousness is also one of the five skandhas. Zen practitioners should always remember that this mind is impermanent, but this mind itself is the main factor that causes us to drift in the samsara, and it is this mind that helps us return to the nirvana. Not only our body is changeable, but also our mind. It changes more rapidly than the body, it changes every second, every minute according to the environment. We are cheerful a few minutes before and sad a few minutes later, laughing then crying, happiness then sorrow. Some people wonder why Buddhism always emphasizes the theory of impermanence? Does it want to spread in the human mind a seed of disheartenment and discourage? In their view, if things are changeable, we do not need to do anything, because if we attain a great achievement, we cannot keep it. This type of reasoning, a first, appears partly logical, but in reality, it is not at all. When the Buddha preached about impermanence, he did not want to discourage anyone, but warning his disciples about the truth. A true Buddhist has to work hard for his own well-being and also for the societies. Although he knows that he is facing the changing reality, he always keeps himself calm. He must refrain from harming others, in contrast, strive to perform good deeds for the benefit and happiness of others. 47. 10 Evil Actions. All karmas are controlled by the threefold deed, body, speech, and mind. Three deeds of the body, four deeds of the mouth, and three deeds of the mind. There are three evil karmas on action of the body, kayu karma. The first evil action of the body is killing. Killing means to take the life of any beings, including human or animal. Killing means the destruction of any living being including animals of all kinds. To complete the offense of killing, five conditions are necessary. A being, consciousness that it is a being, intention of killing, effort of killing, and consequent death. The second evil action of the body is stealing. All forms of acquiring for onself that which belongs to another. To complete the offense of stealing, five conditions are necessary. Property of other people, consciousness that it is stealing, intention of stealing, effort of stealing, and consequent stealing. The second evil action of the body is sexual misconduct. All forms of sex indulgence, by action or thoughts wants. To complete the offense of sexual misconduct, three conditions are necessary. Intent to enjoy the forbidden object, efforts of enjoyment of the object, and possession of the object. The evil karma of speech is the mightiest. We must know that evil speech is even more dangerous than fire, because fire can only destroy all material possessions and treasures of this world, but the fierce fire of evil speech not only burns all the seven treasures of enlightened beings and all virtues of liberation, but it will also reflect on the evil karma vipaka in the future. There are four evil karmas on action of the mouth, vak karma. The first evil action of the speech is lying. To complete the offense of lying, four conditions are necessary. Untruth, intention to deceive, effort of lying, and communication of the matter to others. The second evil action of the speech is insulting or coursing abusive language. The third evil action of the speech is gossiping and frivolous chattering. The fourth evil action of the speech is to slander or speak with a double tongue, or to speak ill of one friend to another. 
There are three evil karmas on action of the mind, more is karma. First, greed or covetousness, second, hatred or loss of temper profanity, and third, ignorance. According to the Theravadan Buddhism, there are ten evil actions. All karmas are controlled by the threefold deed, body, speech, and mind. Three deeds of the body, four deeds of the mouth, and three deeds of the mind. Killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, slandering, harsh language, greed, ill will, and wrong views. First, taking the life of any beings, including human or animal. Killing means the destruction of any living being including animals of all kinds. To complete the offense of killing, five conditions are necessary. A being, consciousness that it is a being, intention of killing, effort of killing, and consequent death. Second, stealing, all forms of acquiring for oneself that which belongs to another. To complete the offense of stealing, five conditions are necessary. Property of other people, consciousness that it is stealing, intention of stealing, effort of stealing, and consequent stealing. Third, sexual misconduct, including all forms of sex indulgence, by action or thoughts wants. To complete the offense of sexual misconduct, three conditions are necessary. Intend to enjoy the forbidden object, efforts of enjoyment of the object, and possession of the object. Fourth, lying or telling lie. To complete the offense of lying, four conditions are necessary. Untruth, intention to deceive, effort, and communication of the matter to others. Fifth, slandering, to slander or speak with a double tongue or to speak ill of one friend to another. To complete the offense of slandering, five conditions are necessary. Division of people, intention to separate people, effort of division, and communication. Sixth, harsh language. The effects of harsh language are being detested by others although blameless. To complete the offense of harsh language, three conditions are necessary. Someone to be abused, angry thought, and using abusive or harsh language. Seventh, frivolous talk and the effects of frivolous talk are disorderliness of the bodily organs and unacceptable speech. To complete the offense of frivolous talk, two conditions are necessary inclination towards frivolous talk and speaking of frivolous talk. The evil karma of speech is the mightiest. We must know that evil speech is even more dangerous than fire, because fire can only destroy all material possessions and treasures of this world, but the fierce fire of evil speech not only burns all the seven treasures of enlightened beings and all virtues of liberation, but it will also reflect on the evil karma vipaka in the future. Eighth, greed or covetousness. To complete the offense of covetousness, two conditions are necessary. Another's property and desire for another's property. Ninth, ill will. To complete the offense of ill will, two conditions are necessary. Another being and I intention of doing harm. Tenth, false view, which means seeing things wrongly without understanding what they truly are. To complete this false view, two conditions are necessary perverted manner in which an object is viewed and misunderstanding of the object according to that wrong view. Therefore, the Buddha taught. Devout Buddhists should always remember in mind the followings. Not to kill, not to steal, not to fornicate, not to lie, not to polish your words for personal advantages, not to slander nor double-tongued, not to use harsh speech, not be of evil speech, not to crave, desire greed, not to be angry and not to be ignorant, stupid, or wrong views. 48. Karma Process. Karmas remain in two bases. In the continuum of the mind and in the eye or the relative. Self. When we act, either good or bad, we see our own actions, like an outsider who witnesses. The pictures of these actions will automatically imprint in our alaya vijnana, subconscious mind, the seed of these actions are sown there and await for enough conditions to spring up its tree and fruits. Similarly, the effect in the alaya vijnana, subconscious mind, of the one who has received our actions. The seed of either love or hate has been sown there, waiting for enough conditions to spring up its tree and fruits. The karma process itself is karma process becoming. The karma should be understood as becoming. 
the karma process becoming in brief is both volition also, and the state's covetousness, etc., associated with the volition, and reckoned as karma too. Karma process becoming consists of the formation of merit, the formation of demerit, the formation of the imperturbable, either with a small, limited plane or with a large plane. All karmas that lead to becoming are called karma process becoming. According to the mind-only school, apart from the obstacles caused by external factors, there are three other causes of karmic obstructions. The first cause is the reaction of evil karmic seeds. Various evil and wholesome karmic seeds are stored randomly in our alayu consciousness. When we recite the Buddha's name or meditate, we accumulate the seeds of transcendental virtue, and therefore, evil karmic seeds have to emerge. For example, if a dense forest full of wild beasts is cleared for habitation, trees and shrubs are cut down, causing these beasts to flee out of the forest. The development of afflictions and obstacles from evil karmic seeds is similar. The second cause is the creating obstacles for themselves due to lack of full understanding of the Dharma. There are cultivators who practice without fully understanding the Dharma, not realizing that the manifestations of the inner mind and the environment are illusory, nor discovering what is true and what is false. They therefore have wrong views. Because of this, they develop thoughts of attachment, happiness, love, worry and fear creating obstacles for themselves when they are faced with objects and conditions within themselves or in the outside world. The third cause is not flexible and patient. Take the case of a man who follows a map, hoping to find a gold mine. The path that he takes crosses high mountains, deep ravines, empty open stretches and dense forests, an itinerary naturally requiring much labor, hardship and adversity. If his mind is not steady, and he does not adapt himself to the circumstances and his own strength, he is bound to retrogress. Alternatively, he may abandon his search, stop at some temporary location, or even lose his life en route. The path of cultivation is the same. Although the practitioner may follow the sutras, if he is not flexible and patient, ready to change according to his own strength and circumstances, and if his determination is weak, he will certainly fail. This obstacle, in the end, is created by himself alone. The Buddha taught. If someone give us something, but we refuse to accept. Naturally, that person will have to keep what they plan to give. This means our pocket is still empty. Similarly, if we clearly understand that karmas or our own actions will be stored in the alayavijnana, subconscious mind, for us to carry over to the next lives, we will surely refuse to store any more karma in the subconscious mind pocket. When the subconscious mind pocket is empty, there is nothing for us to carry over. That means we don't have any result of either happiness or suffering. As a result, the cycle of birth and death comes to an end, the goal of liberation is reached. Once the great radiance of the Buddha Dharma shines on us, it can remove the three obstructions. For all the bad karma created in the past are based upon beginningless greed, hatred, and stupidity, and born of body, mouth and mind. Even in a hundred thousand eons, the karma we create does not perish. When the conditions come together, we must still undergo the retribution ulcers. This is to say the karma we create is sure to bring a result, a corresponding retribution. It is only a matter of time. It depends on whether the conditions have come together or not. Sincere Buddhists should always believe that once the great radiance of the Buddha Dharma shines on us, it can remove the three obstructions and reveal our original pure mind in nature, just as the clouds disperse to reveal the moon. 49. Who is responsible for our karma? Some people say I am not responsible for what I am because everything, including my brain, nature, and physical constitution, partake of the nature of my parents. It's no doubt that our parents and ancestors must be responsible for some of the nature of their descendants, but the majority of other characteristics is the responsibility of the descendants themselves, because beings coming into existence with their own karma that they have produced in their past lives. Moreover, the self that exists after one's childhood is the effect of the karma that one has produced oneself in this world. So the responsibility of one's parents is very limited. 
The idea of karma teaches us clearly that one will reap the fruits of what he has owned. Suppose that we are unhappy at present, we are apt to lose our temper and express discontent if we attribute our unhappiness to others. But if we consider our present unhappiness to be the effect of our own deeds in the past, we can accept it and take responsibility for it. Besides such acceptance, hope for the future wells up strongly in our hearts. The more good karma I accumulate, the happier I will become and the better recompense I will receive. All right, I will accumulate much more good karma in the future. We should not limit this idea only to the problems of human life in this world. We can also feel hope concerning the traces of our lives after death. For those who do not know the teachings of the Buddha, nothing is so terrible as death. Everyone fears it. But if we truly realize the meaning of karma result, we can keep our composure in the face of death because we can have hope for our next life. When we do not think only of ourselves but realize that the karma produced by our own deeds exerts an influence upon our descendants, we will naturally come to feel responsible for our deeds. We will also realize that we, as parents, must maintain a good attitude in our daily lives in order to have a favorable influence or recompense upon our children. We will feel strongly that we must always speak to our children correctly and bring them up properly and with affection. We have done these ourselves, then told others to do them. We know that killing, stealing, committing sexual misconduct, lying, and taking intoxicants are improper ways to behave that causes bad karmas. These offenses are divided into four aspects. Causes, conditions, dharmas, and karma. For example, with killing, there are the causes of killing, the conditions of killing, the dharmas of killing, and the karma of killing. In any of these aspects, one either personally commits the offenses or tells someone else to do it. Doing things ourselves means that we personally engage in the improper deeds. While telling others to do things means encouraging and inciting others to do improper things. This way of indirectly committing an offense is more serious than directly committing it because the offense of fraud is adding to the original offense. Thus, if we do it ourselves, it's already an offense, but if we tell others to do it, the offense is even greater. We create karma by rejoicing at seeing and hearing it done. Rejoicing at seeing and hearing it done means we know someone else is committing an offense and we help that person to do it. Doing things ourselves means that we personally engage in the improper deeds. While rejoicing at seeing and hearing it done means seeing and hearing it done, then encouraging and inciting others to do improper things. Similarly, this way of indirectly committing an offense is more serious than directly committing it because the offense of fraud is adding to the original offense. Thus, if we do it ourselves, it's already an offense, but if we tell others to do it, the offense is even greater. Devout Buddhists should always remember that the Buddha, parents, monks and nuns, sutras, and dharma friends, etc., are all that we need on our way to liberation because we have to learn a lot have to keep precepts strictly, and have to find an appropriate environment for practicing meditation. But only ourselves can watch our mind, and only ourselves can wipe out the three poisons of desire, hatred and ignorance, that have been binding us in the cycle of rebirth since the beginningless time. The Buddha pointed out the way, but we have to do the walking on the path of our liberation. 50. You reap what you sow. Yes, indeed, it is a matter of time, sooner or later, you will reap what you sow. According to the Abhidharma, there are four kinds of karma by time of ripening. The first kind of karma is the immediately effective karma, a karma in which, if it is to ripen, must yield its results in the same existence in which it is performed, otherwise, if it does not meet the opportunity to ripen in the same existence, it becomes defunct. First, the result of a good karma reaped in this life. In the Buddhist legends, there is a story about the result of a good karma reaped in this life. At the time of the Buddha, a couple of husband and wife who possessed only one upper garment to wear when they went outdoor. One day the husband heard the Dharma from the Buddha and was so pleased with the doctrine that he wished to offer his only upper garment to the Buddha, but his innate greed would not permit him to do so. 
he combated with his mind and, eventually overcoming his greed, offered the garment to the Buddha and exclaimed, I have won, I have won. Upon learning this story, the king was so delighted and in appreciation of his generosity, the king presented him with thirty-two robes. The devout husband kept one for himself and another for his wife and offered the rest to the Buddha and the order. Second, the result of a bad karma reaped in this life. In the Buddhist legends, there is a story about the result of a bad karma reaped in this life. At the time of the Buddha, there was a hunter who went hunting to the forest, followed by his dogs, met by the wayside a monk who was proceeding on his alms round. As the hunter could not procure any gain he thought it was due to the unfortunate meeting of the monk. While returning home he met the same monk and was deeply engraved at this second encounter. In spite of the entreaties of the innocent monk, the hunter set the dogs on him. Finding escape therefrom, the monk climbed a tree. The wicked hunter ran up the tree and pierced the soles of the monk's feet with the point of an arrow. The pain was so excruciating that the robe the monk was wearing fell upon the hunter completely covering him. The dogs, thinking that the monk had fallen from the tree, devoured their own master. The second kind of karma is the subsequently effective karma, a karma in which, if it is to ripen, must yield its results in the existence immediately following that in which it is performed, otherwise, it becomes defunct. An example of Upapajavedaniya, a millionaire's servant returned home in the evening after his laborious work in the field to see that all were observing the eight precepts as it was the full moon day. Learning that he also could observe them even for half a day, he took the precepts and fasted at night. Unfortunately he died on the following morning and as a result of his good action was born as a diva. Another good example of subsequently effective karma, Ajatasatru, son of King Bimbisara, was born, immediately after his death, in a state of misery as the result of killing his father. The third kind of karma is the indefinitely effective karma, a karma which can ripen at any time from the second future existence onwards, whenever it gains an opportunity to produce results. It never becomes defunct so long as the round of rebirth continues. No one, not even a Buddha or an Arahant, is exempt from experiencing the results of indefinitely effective karma. No one is exempt from this class of karma. Even the Buddhas and Arahants may reap the effects of their past karma. Arahant Magalana in the remote past, instigated by his wicked wife, attempted to kill his mother and father. As a result of this he suffered long in a woeful state, and in his last birth was clubbed to death by bandits. To the Buddha was imputed the murder of a female devotee of the naked ascetics. This was the result of his having insulted a Paksika Buddha in one of his previous kalpa. The Buddha's foot was slightly injured when Devatava made a futile to kill him. This was due to his killing a stepbrother of his previous birth, with the object of appropriating his property. The fourth kind of karma is the defunct karma. The term Ahosi in Pali does not designate a special class of karma, but applies to karma that was due to ripen in either the present existence or the next existence, but did not meet conditions conductive to its maturation. In the case of arahants, all their accumulated karma from the past which was due to ripen in future lives becomes defunct, with their final passing away with their achievement of non-birth fruit. 5 Uninterrupted Due to 5 Retributions for Karma According to the Earth Store Bodhisattva Sutra, there are 5 uninterrupted due to 5 retributions for karma. What are they? First, punishment is undergone day and night throughout kalpas, and there is no time of respite. Therefore, it is called uninterrupted hell. Second, one person fills it, yet many people also fill it. Therefore, it is called uninterrupted. Third, the implements of punishment are forks, clubs, eagles, serpents, wolves, and dogs, which pound, grind, saw, drill, chisel, cut and chop, boiling liquids, iron nets, iron robes, iron asses, and iron hoses that flay one alive, bind one's head in rawhide, and pour hot iron over one's body, meals of iron pellets and drinks of iron fluids. Throughout many Nayudas of Kalpas such suffering continues without interruption. Therefore, it is called uninterrupted. Fourth, whether a man, a woman, a savage, or someone old or young, 
honorable or lowly, a dragon or a spirit, a god or ghost, everyone must undergo retribution for the offenses he or she has committed. Therefore, it is called uninterrupted. Fifth, if one falls into this hell, from the time of entry, one undergoes ten thousand deaths, and as many rebirths each day and night throughout a hundred thousand kalpas. One may seek relief for the space of a thought, but even such a brief pause does not happen. Only when one's karma is exhausted can one attain rebirth. Because of this continuity, it is called uninterrupted. 51. Karma of previous life. Karma is the accumulation of all our experiences and deeds since the birth of mankind, and since even before that time. This is called the karma of a previous existence. We can clearly see karma of previous existence through the activity or power of karma. This power can be correctly explained by understanding the working of the subconscious mind. Even things that human beings experienced hundreds of thousands of years ago remain in the depths of our minds, as do the much stronger influences of the deeds and mental attitudes of our ancestors. Thus according to Buddhism, karma of previous includes the karma that our own life has produced through the repetition of birth, death, rebirth, death, and so on from the indefinite past to the present. Therefore, the Buddha taught. Even though a hundred thousand kalpa pass, karma which is created does not perish. When cause and conditions come together, retribution or result is a must. In our daily actions, how can we possibly not be cautious and attentive, as if standing on the edge of a deep abyss, as if treading on thin ice? Old karma is what has made up this body of the five aggregates with its relation to the surroundings, such as family, social class, country, etc. Being born as a male or female with good-looking or bad-looking body, with nice complexion or not, with graceful or ungraceful face, with a high or low intelligent quotient, receiving good education or not, etc. These things are out of a person's mind. The gravest result the old karma has left for a human being in this life is his accumulating habits of thirsting for things and thinking of things as having a permanent self which created the current human culture full of troubles. If a person brings up his self in desire, he will strengthen his old karma and go further in suffering. If he stops them, he will come to cease his old and new karma for freedom and happiness. In fact, he appears completely free in the very present moment to make any choice he wants between what he should do and what he should not. It is the present moment which is when he copes. With his desire arising from his mind caused by the attraction of things. According to the Earth Store Bodhisattva Sutra, the Buddha told the contemplator of the world sounds Bodhisattva on previous karmic obstructions as follows. 1. There may be good men and women in the future who have high regard for the great vehicle sutras and make the inconceivable resolve to read them and to recite them from memory. Although they encounter an understanding master who instructs them so that they may become familiar with the texts, whatever they learn they forget in a short while, so that after months or years, they are no longer able to read or recite them from memory. It is because this good man's or good woman's karmic obstructions from past lives have not yet been eradicated that he does not have the proper disposition for reading and reciting sutras of the great vehicle. Upon hearing Earth store Bodhisattva's name or seeing his image, such people should wholly use their original minds and respectfully state their situation to the Bodhisattva. In addition, they should take incense, flowers, clothing, food and drink, as well as all manner of playthings, and make offerings to the Bodhisattva. They should place a bowl of pure water before the Bodhisattva for one day and one night. Afterwards, placing their palms together, let them state their request, and then drink the water while facing south. As the water is about to enter their mouths they should be particularly sincere and solemn. After drinking the water, they should abstain from the five plants of the family, wine, meat, sexual activity, and false speech, as well as killing and harming, for one to three weeks. In dreams, these good men and good women will all see earth store bodhisattva manifesting a limitless body and anointing the crowns of their heads with water. When they awaken they will be endowed with keen intelligence. Should this sutra then pass through their ear faculties one time, they will eternally remember it 
and never forget or lose a single sentence or verse. 2. If there are people in the future whose food and clothing are insufficient, who find their efforts thwarted, or who endure much sickness and ill fortune, whose families are not peaceful, whose relatives are scattered, or who are bothered by unfortunate occurrences, or who are often startled in their sleep by dreams, such people, upon hearing Earth's door's name and seeing his image, should recite his name a full ten thousand times with extreme sincerity and respect. Those displeasing matters will gradually be eradicated, and they will attain peace and happiness. Their food and clothing will be abundant, and even if their dreams they will be peaceful and happy. 3. If good men or good women in the future must enter mountain forests, cross over rivers, seize or other large bodies of water, or if they must take dangerous routes either for the sake of earning their own livelihood, or for public or personal affairs, or matters of life and death, or other urgent business, such people should first recite the name of Earth's store Bodhisattva ten thousand times. The ghosts and spirits of the lands they pass through will then guard and protect them in their walking, standing, sitting and lying down. The peace and happiness of those persons will constantly be preserved, so that even if they encounter tigers, wolves, lions or any other harmful or poisonous creatures, the creatures will be unable to harm them. 52. New Karma. The new karma is what a man has done, is doing and will do in this life through his body, speech and mind. The Buddha always emphasizes on an individual's new karma. His teaching is centered on seeing the truth of dependent origination of the five aggregates and detaching from them for true happiness. According to Buddhism, karma is volitional action. Volitional action is activities aggregates. The operation of activities of aggregate is that of the five aggregates. So karma is actually the operation of those aggregates. The Buddhist way of releasing the bondage of karma means releasing the bondage of the five aggregates. The cultivation of aggregates includes controlling a person's habits of things as having a permanent self from which desire for things arise, and developing his regard to things as non-self from which desireless thought arises. Being obedient to karma, there is not self, admin, in whatever beings that are produced by the interplay of karmic conditions, pain and pleasure we suffer are also the results of our previous action. If I am rewarded with fortune, honor, etc., this is the outcome of my past deeds which, by reason of causation, affect my present life. When the force of karma is exhausted, the result I am enjoying now will disappear, what is then the use of being joyful over it? Gain or loss, let us accept karma as it brings us the one or the other, the spirit itself knows neither increase nor decrease. The wind of gladness does not move it, as it is silently in harmony with the path. Therefore, his is called being obedient to karma. Wholesome or unwholesome karma never disappears until its result ripens. However, declaration or confession of non-virtuous actions can dispel the potential power of future negative karma. According to the Buddhist theory, karma, wholesome or unwholesome, never disappears until its result ripens. However, the purification of accumulated negative karma is possible by declaring, confessing and stopping committing of non-virtuous actions. Generally speaking, no matter what kind of karma, new or old, Buddhists should remember an absolute truth that no karma created will go without having karmic retribution. 53. Karma process becoming. The karma process itself is karma process becoming. The karma should be understood as becoming. The karma process becoming in brief is both volition also, and the state's covetousness, etc., associated with the volition, and reckoned as karma too. Karma process becoming consists of the formation of merit, the formation of demerit, the formation of the imperturbable, either with a small, limited, plane or with a large plane. All karmas that lead to becoming are called karma process becoming. Karmic process is the energy that out of a present life conditions a future life in unending sequence. In this process there is nothing that passes or transmigrates from one life to another. It is only a movement that continues unbroken. The being who passes away here and takes birth elsewhere is neither the same person nor a totally different one. 
there is the last moment of consciousness, cutie sitter vinana, belonging to the immediately previous life, immediately next, upon the cessation of that consciousness, but conditioned by it, there arises the first moment of consciousness of the present birth, which is called a relinking or rebirth consciousness, Padasandi Vinana. Similarly, the last thought moment in this life conditions the first thought moment in the next. In this way consciousness comes into being and passes away yielding place to new consciousness. Thus, this perpetual stream of consciousness goes on until existence ceases. Existence in a way is consciousness, the will to live, to continue. 54. Four kinds of karma by way of function. According to the Abhidharma, there are four kinds of karma by way of function. The first kind of karma is the productive karma, which is wholesome or unwholesome volition which produces resultant mental states and karma-born materiality, both at the moment of rebirth linking and during the course of existence. At the moment of conception, productive karma generates the rebirth linking consciousness and the karma-born types of materiality, constituting the physical body of the new being. During the course of existence it produces other resultant siddhas and the continuities of karma-born materiality, such as the sense, faculties, sexual determination, and the heart base. Only a karma that has attained the status of a full course of action can perform the function of producing rebirth linking, but all wholesome and unwholesome karmas without exception can produce results during the course of existence. Every subsequent birth, according to Buddhism, is conditioned by the good or bad karma which predominant at the moment of death. This kind of karma is technically known as reproductive karma. The death of a person is merely the temporary end of a temporary phenomenon. Though the present form perishes, another form which is neither absolutely the same nor totally different takes place according to the thought that was powerful at the death moment, since the karmic force which hitherto actuated it is not annihilated with the dissolution of the body. It is this last thought process, which is termed reproductive karma, that determines the state of a person in his subsequent birth. As a rule, the last thought process depends on the general conduct of a person in daily life. In some exceptional cases, perhaps due to favorable or unfavorable circumstances, at the moment of death a good person may experience a bad thought, and a bad person a good one. The future birth will be determined by this last thought process, irrespective of the general conduct. This does not mean that the effects of the past actions are obliterated they will produce their inevitable results as the appropriate moment. The second kind of karma is the supportive karma, which does not gain an opportunity to produce its own result, it is to say it does have the wholesome or unwholesome nature, but which, when some other karma or productive karma is exercising a productive function, supports it either by enabling it to produce its pleasant or painful results over an extended time without obstruction, or by reinforcing the continuum of aggregates produced by another karma. When through the productive function of wholesome karma, it may cause one to be reborn as a human being, contribute to the extension of one's lifespan, ensure that one is healthy and wealthy, and well provide with the necessities of life. When an unwholesome karma has exercised its productive function, it may cause one to be reborn as an animal, cause a painful disease, and prevent medicines from working effectively, thereby prolonging the disease. The third kind of karma is the obstructive karma. The obstructive karma is a karma which cannot produce its own result, wholesome or unwholesome, but nevertheless obstructs, frustrates, or delays some other karma from producing results, countering its efficacy or shortening the duration of its pleasant or painful results. Even though a productive karma may be strong at a time it is accumulated, an obstructive karma directly opposed to it may counteract it, so that it becomes impaired when producing its results. For example a wholesome karma tending to produce rebirth in a superior plane of existence may be impeded by an obstructive karma, so that it generates rebirth in a lower plane. A wholesome productive karma tends to produce rebirth among high families, may be impeded by an obstructive karma, therefore, it may produce rebirth among low families. A wholesome productive karma tends to produce longevity may be impeded by an obstructive karma, therefore life may become shortened.
a wholesome productive karma tends to produce beauty may be impeded by an obstructive karma, therefore it may produce a plain appearance. An unwholesome productive karma tends to produce rebirth and the great hells may be counteracted by an obstructive wholesome karma and produce rebirth in the minor hells or among the hungry ghosts. The fourth kind of karma is the destructive karma. A man may, through his productive karma, have been originally destined for a long lifespan, but a destructive karma may arise and bring about a premature death. According to the Abhidharma, a destructive karma is a wholesome or unwholesome karma which supplants other weaker karma, prevents it from ripening, and produces instead its own result. At the time of near death, at first a sign of bad destination may appear by the power and evil karma, heralding bad rebirth, but then a good karma may emerge, expel the bad karma, and having caused the sign of good destination to appear. A bad karma may suddenly arise, cut off the productive potential of a good karma, and generate rebirth in a woeful realm. 55. Four kinds of karma by order of ripening. According to the Abhidharma, there are four kinds of karma by order of ripening. The first kind of karma is the weighty karma, wholesome or unwholesome, is a weighty or serious action, or karma of such powerful moral weight that it cannot be replaced by any other karma as the determinant of rebirth. It is so called because it produces its effect for certain in this life or in the next life. When there is no weighty karma to condition the future birth a death proximate, asana, karma might operate. On the wholesome side, this karma is the attainment of the jhanas, other than speech and body karmas. On the unwholesome side, it is the five heinous crimes together with a fixed wrong view that denies the basis for morality. Causing the wounding of a Buddha, i.e. Devadatta lost his psychic powers and was born in a woeful state because he wounded the Buddha. Maliciously creating a schism in the Sangat, i.e. Devadatta who was reborn in a woeful state because he caused a schism in the Sangat, murdering an arahant, killing one's own father, and killing one's own mother. As the Buddha remarked, King Ajatasatru would have attained a first state of sainthood if he had not committed parricide. In this case, the powerful evil karma obstructed his spiritual attainment. If someone were to develop the jhanas and later were to commit one of the heinous crimes, his good karma would be obliterated by the evil deed, and the latter would generate rebirth into a state of misery. For example, the Buddha's ambitious cousin Devadatta lost his psychic powers and was reborn in hell for wounding the Buddha and causing a schism in the Sangha. If someone were first to commit one of the heinous crimes, he could not later reach a sublime or supermundane attainment because the evil karma would create an insurmountable obstruction. Thus King Ajatasadu, while listening to the Buddha speak the Samanaphala Sutra, the discourse on the fruits of recluseship, had all the other conditions for reaching stream entry, but because he had killed his father, King Bimbisara, he could not attain the path and fruit. The second kind of karma is the death proximate karma, an action or a potent karma remembered or done shortly before death, dying moment, that is, immediately prior to the last jhavana process. If a person of bad character remembers a good deed he has done or performs a good deed just before dying, he may receive a fortunate rebirth, and conversely, if a good person dwells on an evil deed done earlier or performs an evil deed just before dying, he may undergo an unhappy rebirth. For this reason, or it's significant in determining the future birth, in Buddhist countries, it is customary to remind a dying person of his good deeds or to urge him to arouse good thoughts during the last moment of his life. When there is no weighty karma, and a potent death proximate karma is performed, this karma will generally takes on the role of generating rebirth. This does not mean that a person will esk up the fruits of the other good and bad deeds he has committed during the course of life. When they meet with conditions, these karmas too will produce their due results. The third kind of karma is the habitual karma, which is a deed that one habitually or constantly performs either good or bad. Habits, whether good or bad, become second nature. They more or less tend to mold the character of a person. In the absence of weighty karma and a potent death proximate karma, this type of karma generally assumes the rebirth generative function. The fourth kind of karma is the reserve karma, 
which is any other deed, not included productive death proximate destructive karmas, which is potent enough to take on the role of generating rebirth. This type of karma becomes operative when there is no karma of other three types to exercise this function. This is as it were the reserve fund of a particular being, divided into four classifications. First, evil actions which may ripen in the sense sphere, there are ten evil actions. Killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, slandering, harsh speech, frivolous talk, covetousness, ill will, and false views. Second, good actions which may ripen in the sense sphere. Third, good actions which may ripen in the realms of form, Rupaloka. Fourth, good actions which may ripen in the formless realms, Arupaloka. 56. Four kinds of karma by place of ripening. The first kind of karma is the unwholesome kama, karma. Unwholesome deeds will produce painful results. Unwholesome deeds include the following, but not limited to greed, anger, ignorance, arrogance, doubt, improper views, killing living things, stealing or taking what is not given, sexual misconduct, and wandering thoughts. According to the path of purification, ten unwholesome deeds are both unprofitable action and courses that lead to unhappy destinies. Killing living things, taking what is not given, sexual misconduct, false speech, malicious speech, harsh speech, gossip, covetousness, ill will, and wrong views. The second kind of karma is the wholesome kama, karma, pertaining to the sense sphere. Pusala karma means volitional action that is done in accordance with the Aryan Eightfold Noble Path. So, Kusala karma is not only in accordance with the right action, but it is also always in accordance with the right view, right understanding, right speech, right livelihood, right energy, right concentration and right samadhi. According to the Dharmapada Sutra, verse 183, the Buddha taught. Not to do evil, to do good, to purify one's mind, this is the teaching of the Buddhas. Kusala karmas or good deeds will help a person control a lot of troubles arising from his mind. Inversely, if a person does evil deeds he will receive bad results in this life and the next existence which are suffering. The third kind of karma is the wholesome kama, karma, pertaining to the fine material sphere. The fourth kind of karma is the wholesome kama, karma, pertaining to the immaterial sphere. 57. Sufferings. All existence is characterized by suffering and does not bring satisfaction. There is no equivalent translation in English for the word ducat in both Pali and Sanskrit. So the word ducat is often translated as suffering. However, this English word is sometimes misleading because it connotes extreme pain. When the Buddha described our lives as dukkha, he was referring to any and all unsatisfactory conditions. These range from minor disappointments, problems and difficulties to intense pain and misery. Therefore, dukkha should be used to describe the fact that things are not completely right in our lives and could be better. Both dukkha, skt, or dukkha, p, are Sanskrit and Pali terms for suffering or unsatisfactoriness. This is the first of the Four Noble Truths of Buddhism, which holds that cyclic existence is characterized by unsatisfactoriness or suffering. This is related to the idea that since the things of the world are transitory, beings are inevitably separated from what they desire, and forced to endure what is unpleasant. The main stated goal of Buddhism from its inception is overcoming dukkha. There are three main types of dukkha. 1. The suffering of misery, dukkha dukkata, which includes physical and mental sufferings, 2. The suffering of change, viparinama dukkata, which includes all contaminated feelings of happiness. These are called sufferings because they are subject to change at any time, which leads to unhappiness, and 3. Compositional suffering, samskara dukkata, the suffering endemic to cyclic existence, in which sentient beings are prone to the dissatisfaction due to being under the influence of contaminated actions and afflictions. After the Great Enlightenment, the Buddha declared his first discourse at the Deer Park. Life is nothing but suffering, and the five aggregates are suffering. At other time in the Sravasti, the Buddha repeated the same discourse. I will teach you, Bixus, pain and the root of pain. Do you listen to it? And what, Bixus, is pain? 
body, bixis, is pain, feeling is pain, perception is pain, the activities are pain, and consciousness is pain. That, bixis, is the meaning of pain. And what, bixis, is the root of pain. It is this craving that leads downward to rebirth, along with the lure of lust, that lingers longingly now here and there. Namely, the craving for sense, the craving for rebirth, the craving to have done with rebirth. In other words, human being suffering is really the result of the arising of dependent origination, also the arising of the five aggregates. And thus, it is not the five aggregates or human beings in the world that cause suffering, but a person's craving for the five aggregates that causes suffering. The Buddha described three main characteristics of dukkha which we face in our daily lives. First, the suffering of pain occurs whenever we are mentally or physically miserable. Physical suffering includes headaches and scraped knees, as well as torment of cancer and heart attacks. Mental suffering occurs whenever we fail to get what we want, when we lose something we are attached to, or when misfortune comes our way. We are sad when our career goal cannot be achieved, we're depressed when we part from loved ones, we are anxious when we are waiting to obtain a letter from our children, etc. Second, the suffering of change indicates that activities we generally regard as pleasurable in fact inevitably change and become painful. When we first buy a new shirt, we like it because it looks gorgeous, however, three years later, we may be suffering or feeling uncomfortable when we wear it because it is old and becomes worn out. No matter how much we like a person and we feel happy when we are with that person, however, when we spend too much time with that person, it makes us uncomfortable. Thus, happiness was never inherent in the person we like, but was a product of the interaction between us and that person. Third, the pervasive compounded suffering refers to our situation of having bodies and minds prone to pain. We can become miserable simply by the changing of external conditions. The weather changes and our bodies suffer from the cold, how a friend treats us changes and we become depressed. Our present bodies and minds compound our misery in the sense that they are the basis for our present problems. Our present bodies are the basis upon which we experience bad health. If we did not have a body that was receptive to pain, we would not fall ill no matter how many viruses and germs we were exposed to. Our present minds are the basis upon which we experience the pain and hurt feelings. If we had minds that were not contaminated by anger, then we would not suffer from the mental anguish of conflict with others. In Buddhism, there are two categories of sufferings. Physical and mental sufferings. Sufferings from within such as sickness or sorrow. First, physical sufferings or sufferings caused by diseases, including the suffering of birth, old age, sickness and death. The suffering of the body means that our body is not only impure, it is subject to birth, old age, disease and death as well as to heat and cold, hunger and thirst, and other hardships that cause us to suffer, preventing us from being free and happy. Yes, indeed, birth is inevitably suffering for both the mother and the infant, and because it is from birth, other forms of suffering, such as old age, sickness and death, inevitably follow. Physical suffering takes many forms. People must have observed at one time or another how their aged relatives suffer. Most of them suffer aches and pains in their joints, and many find it hard to move about by themselves. With advancing age, the elderly find life difficult because they cannot see, hear or eat properly. The pain of disease, which strikes young and old alike, can be unbearable. The pain of death brings much suffering. Even the moment of birth gives pain, both to the mother and the child who is born. The truth is that the suffering of birth, old age, sickness and death are unavoidable. Some fortunate people may now be enjoying happy and carefree lives, but it is only a matter of time before they too will experience suffering. What is worse, nobody else can share this suffering with the one that suffers. For example, a man may be very concerned that his mother is growing old. Yet he cannot take her place and suffer the pain of aging on her behalf. Also, if a boy falls very ill, his mother cannot experience the discomfort of his illness for him. Finally, neither mother nor son can help each other when the moment of death comes. 
Second, the mental sufferings are the sufferings of the mind. Besides physical suffering, there are also various forms of mental suffering. Mental suffering such as sadness, distress, jealousy, bitterness, unsatisfaction, unhappiness, etc. People feel sad, lonely or depressed when they lose someone they love through separation or death. They become irritated or uncomfortable when they are forced to be in the company of those whom they dislike or those who are unpleasant. People also suffer when they are unable to satisfy their needs and wants, etc. The suffering of the mind means that when the mind is afflicted, it is necessarily consumed by the fire of afflictions, bound by the ropes of afflictions, struck, pursued and ordered about by the whip of afflictions, defiled and obscured by the smoke and dust of afflictions. Thus, whoever develops afflictions is lacking in wisdom, because the first person he has caused to suffer is himself. Besides, there is also the suffering of the environment. The suffering of the environment means that this earth is subject to the vagaries of the weather, scorching heat, frigid cold and pouring rain, while sentient beings must toil and suffer day in and day out to earn a living. Tragedies occur every day, before our very eyes. In this world, worries and miseries are twin evils that go hand in hand. They coexist in this world. If you feel worried, you are miserable, and vice versa, when you are miserable, you are worried. Devout Buddhists should always remember that worries are made by our own minds, and by nothing else we create them in our own minds, for we fail to understand the danger of attachment and egoistic feelings. To be able to overcome these problems, we must try to contemplate and to train our minds carefully, because an untrained mind is the main cause of all the problems including worries and miseries. The most important fact is that we should always have a smile for ourselves as well as for others in any circumstances. The Buddha taught. Worries only arise in the fool, not in the wise. Worries and miseries are nothing but states of mind. Negative thoughts produce worries and miseries, while positive thoughts produce happiness and peace. The Buddha teaches that suffering is everywhere, suffering is already enclosed in the cause, suffering from the effect, suffering throughout time, suffering pervades space, and suffering governs both normal people and saint. From internal sufferings to external sufferings. Internal sufferings include both physical and mental sufferings. Physical sufferings are sufferings from within, such as sickness or sorrow. Mental sufferings are spiritual sufferings such as sadness, distress, jealousy, bitterness, unsatisfaction, unhappiness, etc. External sufferings include sufferings from outside circumstances such as calamities, wars, etc. The Buddha said that whatever is impermanent is suffering because although impermanence is not a cause for suffering, it creates occasions for suffering. For not understanding of impermanence, we crave and cling to objects in the hope that they may be permanent, that they may yield permanent happiness. Failing to understand that youth, health, and life itself are impermanent, we crave them and cling to them. We desperately hold on to our youth and try to prolong our life, yet because they are impermanent by nature, they keep changing rapidly, and we will surely one day become old and sick. When this occurs, impermanence is the main agent which creates occasions for suffering. According to the Connected Discourses of the Buddha, Chapter Asanavago, Searches, there are three aspects of dukkha that all sentient beings experience. They are suffering due to pain, suffering due to change, and suffering due to formations. First, dukkha is ordinary suffering, or suffering due to pain, or suffering that produced by direct causes or suffering of misery including physical suffering such as pain, old age, death, as well as mental anxieties. The suffering within suffering is experienced when people do not have a place to live, clothes to keep out the colder heat, or food to eat to survive, etc. Dukkha is produced by change, or suffering due to change, or suffering by loss or deprivation or change, for example, people who are rich, who have a good life, but then a sudden fire burns up all their property, leaving them destitute. Or maybe they die in a plane crash or a shipwreck. These are the sufferings of decay. Third, dukkha is conditioned states, or suffering due to formations, or suffering by the passing or impermanency of all things, body and mind are impermanent. 
Everybody of us experiences childhood, young days of life, then grows old and dies. Our thoughts flow on in a continuous succession, and we cannot control them. When we grow old, our eyes get blurry, our ears become deaf, and our hands and feet are no longer nimble, but start to tremble. These are the sufferings of process. The Buddha's teaching on suffering, above all, offers a solution to the fundamental problem of the human condition. According to Buddhism, human existence is distinguished by the fact that nothing is permanent. No happiness will last forever, and whatever else there is, there will always be suffering and death. The first step in the Buddhist path to awakening is to recognize this as the foremost problem of human existence, to see that all is dukkha. However, this is not a pessimistic observation, because while acknowledging the ubiquity of dukkha, Buddhism offers a solution in the form of the path, leading to the cessation of dukkha. The Buddha himself characterized his teaching by saying, I teach only dukkha and the cessation of dukkha. Dukkha can be experienced in three ways. The first is simply the ordinary suffering that affects people when the body is in pain. Ordinary suffering is also mental pain. It is the grief of not getting what one wants or the distress caused by separation from loved ones or from pleasant conditions. It is also the many other painful situations that one inevitably encounters by virtue of being born, aging and dying. Underlying any happiness is the knowledge that whenever there is pleasure or delight, it will not be permanent. Sooner or later the vicissitudes of life will bring about a change. There is a Buddhist saying that even in laughter there is dukkha because all laughter is impermanent. This instability underlies the second kind of dukkha, which is dissatisfaction arising from change. It might seem that only death can bring about the cessation of suffering, but in fact death is also a form of suffering. In Buddhism the cosmos extends far beyond the immediate physical world perceptible by the senses, and death is merely part of the endless cycle of rebirth. Death in itself offers no respite because actions have consequences in future lives far beyond death, just as deeds from previous lives have affected the present. The third kind of suffering is the inherent interconnectedness of actions and deeds, which exceeds human vision and experience. In this sense, suffering applies to the universe in its totality, and no imaginable beings, humans, gods, demons, animals or hell beings, are exempt from it. Suffering thus refers not only to everyday suffering, but also to the whole infinite world of possible and seemingly endless forms of suffering. No simple translation can capture its full significance. The goal of Buddhism is the complete and final cessation of every form of dukkha, and thereby the attainment of nirvana, the eradication of greed, hatred and delusion, which ties beings to the cycle of rebirth. Accordingly, Buddhas and those who reach enlightenment do not experience dukkha, because strictly speaking they are not beings, nor do they roll in the samsara. They will never again be reborn. Dukkha characterizes the cosmos as a whole, but its predominance varies among the different spheres of existence. In the world of pure form, where the great gods dwell, there is less suffering than in the world of sense desire, inhabited by lesser gods, humans and other beings. Just the Buddha when he walked the earth could enter the world of the sense desire, so too can humans enter the world of pure form. This is ordinarily accomplished in meditation, through different kinds of absorptions, dhyana. The characteristic form of suffering in this situation is impermanence, caused by the meditator's inability to remain eternally in trance. To attain more abiding happiness, an individual must strive to understand the processes that govern movement in the cosmos as a whole, namely, rebirth and karma, and how they can be affected. This is the end of this video, thank you for listening. Please continue to support and help this channel grow. As you already know, Buddha emphasized the importance of generosity supporting the spread of the Dharma for spiritual growth, we can cultivate this virtue in our digital age. Now I need your help spreading the Buddha teaching further by subscribing, liking, and sharing our channel, you're supporting the dissemination of valuable teachings, much like this Sangha was supported in the past. Your engagement accumulates positive karma for you and helps make the Dharma accessible to a wider audience, a meritorious act indeed. 
let's do this with pure intentions, free from attachment and selfishness, fostering a sense of community and supporting our own spiritual journey. These principles, rooted in Buddhist ethics, continue to guide us. You will receive great blessings for supporting the propagation of Buddha's teachings in a very simple way. By subscribing, liking, and sharing to help spreading the Buddha teaching to all human beings. Wishing you and your family always have a peaceful and happy life.